Good evening. Thanks so much for joining the CLE panel, focusing on restorative justice tonight that's sponsored by the Alternative Dispute Resolution Program at New York Law School. I love the idea that the mediators and the restorative justice people are all coming together. So there's a lot of peace and healing going on here. Um, so much for that adversarial system they tried to teach us in law school. Um, thank you to Dean Crowell. I don't know if you're here, but I know you've supported a lot of the restorative justice programming. And thank you so much to Peter Phillips, who is the director of the ADR program. Um, for inviting me to organize this panel and bring together these wonderful people. And thanks to Rose White and Jorge Rodriguez who are behind the scenes doing all this work. It's so exciting that we're presenting these people because of the work that these four amazing panelists are doing. And it's also exciting because of the way the principles of restorative justice, which are quite old and have been functioning in indigenous communities for so many years, um, are finally being understood by so many others and um, are broadening our understanding and opening up the lens through which we view our work and our relationships to each other and our communities and our lives. Um, though I don't know, I'm guessing that a lot of you here um, are mediators and arbitrators uh, who work on conflict resolution and compromise from all different directions. And in many ways, there is an overlap um, or a synchronicity in the work that mediators and arbitrators do and in the work of restorative justice. Um, many of you are more familiar with restorative justice in the criminal legal realm, um, where someone who was harmed might want to meet with um, someone who has caused harm in order to facilitate their healing and someone who has caused harm might want to meet with the others who were harmed in order to take accountability. Um, and those cases are in the news sometimes and they get, I think, a little more attention in the media um, than the civil side of things, than, than situations that involve uh, community building and conflict resolution and healing and harm but are not criminal cases. And that's what we're gonna focus on tonight is the non-criminal cases um, and how restorative practices um, can be used or implemented in a lot of work. Some of it is conflict resolution work, but the point is not to reach a compromise with restorative justice, but rather to work towards healing and accountability and to do it usually with a community working together in a non-hierarchical way towards some kind of consensus. Now that's not always, there are all kinds of programs that partially use restorative justice ideas and some that are more purely restorative. And we're gonna hear about a spectrum of different ways that restorative principles can be applied. Um, but people, for example, people serving sentences in prison can create restorative justice circles while they're serving sentences in prison just to work on their own accountability, but not necessarily meeting with the person that they were harmed. Um, people can meet in separate circles. People can not meet in circles. Circle practice is just one practice of restorative justice. And people can work on healing and accountability in all kinds of ways. Um, restorative justice involves the hard work of taking accountability and recognizing that we've all harmed people and we have all been harmed and that no one is, should be reduced to the worst thing they've ever done. Um, we uh, have had, uh, we tend to look at harm in a binary way, especially in the legal system who's the good person, who's the bad person, who's fault, who gets blamed. And restorative justice really looks through a different lens. And as I said, recognizes we've all been harmed, we've all caused harm, and trying to find a way to understand how we can heal and move forward rather than uh, finding the facts or assigning blame. Um, 
So in schools, for example, restorative justice work can be conflict resolution work. If there was a behavior violation, if somebody was harmed or hurt, but it can also be uh, community building work when there's no conflict at all. And um, because the focus of restorative justice usually has a wider lens and is interested in the whole context behind people's behavior, including systemic harms, not just the behavior of someone who might be labeled as bad. Um, restorative justice can sometimes address deeper systemic harms that infect our institutions like racism, like gender and LGBT bias, and look at underlying causes of harm that aren't just attributable to an individual. Um, we will hear from, uh, we will hear from Kelsey Sayers about the work in the schools. We will hear from Seithu Nair about how restorative justice practices can be, can be implemented in the work of healing people who have been impacted in child by child sexual violence when there's no active criminal charge, when there may be no current or ongoing harm, and when people voluntarily want to work on healing. And that can take all kinds of forms. We'll hear from Erica Sasson about when and why restorative work might be appropriate in addressing intimate partner violence, which is something that may be counterintuitive to a lot of people and people don't really expect that to be appropriate. Um, so I think we're gonna talk about um, some, a study that took place about across the country, how people are dealing with intimate partner violence and sometimes um, voluntarily using restorative justice practices. And finally, we'll hear from Judge Deborah Martin, a court of claims judge in Rochester, New York, who after observing the way unaddressed emotional harm sometimes impedes people's ability to resolve civil matters, either through litigation or settlement, because they're not dealing with the most intense underlying harm. She has developed her own program that implements some restorative principles into her settlement, her work with settlement of cases, civil cases, to help the litigants heal, sometimes parallel to the, their own lawsuits. And in my view, her work is really melding a lot of the principles of mediation with the principles of restorative justice. So the way we're going to proceed is that I will ask questions of one panelist at a time for about 12 minutes each, which is really not enough time for all of they have to say, but we're gonna do the best we can. And then following that, I'm gonna ask some questions to all the panelists and any one of them can answer and maybe engage in a discussion with each other. And then at the end, we will leave about 15 or 20 minutes uh, for your questions. And I would ask all of you um, to just write your questions in the chat as we go along. So at the end, I can read some of those questions, whatever we have time for, to our panelists. And we would love to hear questions from you. Finally, if you want CLE credit from the state of New York, which we're happy to give you, um, you'll have to write down the three code words that I say during the course of this program. Um, and then at the end, you can just scribble them down now in your notes. And then at the end, when you fill out the form for CLE credit, just copy those three words to show that you were with us the whole time. So the first word that I will give you will be about um, 20 or 25 minutes in, and then maybe a half an hour later, and then at the end, there'll be three separate words. That's if you want CLE credits. So um, now we're going to start with Seithu, and um, I'm thrilled to have you here. I'm not gonna go into your bio too much because everybody has the materials and I wanna use the time. Um, but I wanted to ask you first, I do wanna get into the conversation about hidden water. Um, but I wanted to ask you first about your work at Oath, the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, and just get an overall sense if you do restorative work there, and if so, in what kinds of contexts and what kinds of work it is that you do. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Can you, Susan, still? Yes. Great. My name is Seithu, and I'm really glad you mentioned 
the uh, my my work at Oath. Um, I would say it's the Center for Creative Conflict Resolution within Oath. So Oath is the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, which is the <clears throat> um, administrative uh, court in New York City. And uh, the the small group where I work is called the Center for Creative Conflict Resolution. And there, what we do, or I would say, what we began to do is really just bring mediation into the workplace, into the city government context. Um, our director who's actually in the gallery or audience today, um, Judge Kramer is here today. Um, <clears throat> he is, a, you know, we like to say visionary, he likes to stay stubborn, but um, about, he just had a vision about bringing in alternatives into this workplace context. And um, so we started offering mediations and then eventually really you know, it, it's really just common sense when you start to engage in conflict in, a, in a, any context, you learn that there is so much more going on. So eventually the work expanded into offering coaching, doing group work, working with leaders, commissioners, executive directors. And then, I'll, you know, it was a few years into the work that uh, some of us, a few of us joined and we brought in just training and background in restorative justice and practices. And the, it was, kind of seamless because we had a context and a, a natural community in the city government workplace. And so we started to imp think about how to implement elements of restorative practices. So I, I say we don't do restorative justice work in this context. We do, we apply elements of restorative practices into this context, meaning we think about how to use, um, how to build cohesion or how in, in, a, in the workplace community, we think about um, building conflict competence, you know, like mediation and helping people resolve conflicts is one thing, but helping people have the tools to be able to have difficult conversations on their own is another. And so one example of how restorative practices used in that context is community building circles, for example. So as you know, any workplace is full of teams and units of people who work together over long periods of time, have relationships, are together every day in effect. And so there's one of the ways that we use restorative practices is by using community building circles in the workplace context and really helping people be able to have discussions together, disagree together. Um, and the other element is working with leaders. You know, oftentimes in these contexts, because it's a hierarchy in the workplace, if leaders aren't bought into having time and space in the workplace, to have certain kinds of conversation, then it these efforts sort of fall short. And so we work with leaders. I, what I will say is that <clears throat> using restorative practices in this context or any context is really not about, just about using circles or sitting in circles. It's about sort of embodying and, in, and taking on a particular way, you know, a way that is oriented towards the repair of relationships in an ongoing way. The, a way that is inclusive, inclusive of people, even when we don't understand them. Um, so it's really, I would say, it's more about a way or a culture that you create in your group rather than just sitting around and practicing circles. So that's the work in short. There are a million more things I could say about that. Re well, last thing I'll say about that is this past February, the mayor signed an executive order that established our center as a central go-to resource for ADR and restorative programming across city government. So that has really opened the doors for us to do more work. And, and we've begun to do some public facing work also, which we can talk about another time. But yes. I know Susan, you wanted me to yeah. focus on hidden water. Everything is such a mouthful sometimes. Um, hidden water is an organization. It's a nonprofit small group organization that uses healing circles uh, peacemaking circles to heal the impact of child sexual abuse harm on the family system. I say all these words slowly because there, there is so much to take in there. Um, <clears throat> when, I, when we work with adults, so adults who have either been impacted by child when they were children um, by sexual abuse and harm, or adults who have harmed young people or children, um, and other people in the family system. So if you know any, if, you're, if you look into your own family system, you'll see that there, there is often a thing, a, a harm or something that happens. And then there are a lot of different parts of the system that are impacted. And so what's wonderful about 
hidden water is that we don't just work with people who've been harmed or people who caused harm. Usually these are the two primary categories of people that are thought about as needed or necessary for a restorative circle. We also work with people who are indirectly impacted. For example, people who have been responsible guardians or parents of that child who was harmed or other people in the family system, for example, spouses, partners, cousins, brothers, people who are impacted by what the harm or what we like to say the shame event in the family system. And so the idea is that if everybody in the system works on their own healing and then, then there's a possibility for people to come together. Um, so we have something called a multi-system circle or a full colored circle. What I say the word color because we don't, we refer to each of these circles by color. So a green circle is a circle for people who've been harmed. So you can only participate in that circle if you've had the experience of being harmed. That includes the facilitator. This is another unique part of the hidden water model. So in the green circle where that is designed for people who have been harmed, the facilitator or the circle keeper also has to be of that experience. This is really powerful because it takes out the social worker otherization that happens in the context of healing. Similar to, sim this is the same in the other circles where uh, a person who has caused harm also sits in circle with others who've caused harm and is the facilitator is also a person who has caused harm. So this is, I, I point to this because this is an important element of addressing shame, which is a, a shame and fear. And these are really core, core experiences, you know, human experiences that really either limit or can free us from, from uh, what is the, what's the way to say this? From, I guess, repeating the cycles and the patterns of harm and abuse in the family system. Uh, the orange circle is for parents or responsible guardians, same thing. And then the blue circle is for other family members and support people. And so essentially what happens is each of these colors, they sit, we sit in circles, 12-week <clears throat> cycle. Each circle is a 12-week cycle. So once you partici participate in the 12-week cycle, then you have the option to sit in a family system circle, which are people from each of these different colored circles. Essentially, you're then a person who's been, who's been harmed, a person who caused harm, a responsible parent or a guardian, and other family members are essentially sitting together. So. Two things I'll say, I don't know about the time. I don't know how much time I have left, but. We have about one or one minute left, so. Okay, great, great. What I, what I will say is that sometimes we work with actual families who come in, a group, you know, people who are in relationship to one another and have want to do this work as a family. But oftentimes the thing about trauma and the, is that it causes a lot of disconnection in the family system. So people, aren't necessarily, not all families are necessarily ready and willing to come and do this work together. So the, mul the, the multicolored circles are designed for that. So it's essentially like a pseudo family system circle. I know I'm saying a lot, but this is fundamentally the model of the hidden water circles. And I will say that what is most, I guess most, most powerful is that <clears throat> everybody's sitting together with a shared experience, then trying to heal together in this form that I hope many, I don't know how many people here have actually experienced sitting in a circle or experienced the, how it moves you. Um, it, it's powerful, especially if you're sitting in to work on something that is really deeply personal to you. Okay, I just there. wanted to uh, ask one more thing. Um, yeah. Are any of these people in the middle of an ongoing criminal case or how did they get there? Yeah, so everybody in the in the room is there voluntarily. We rarely case we we don't take necessarily people who are sent we to of this program or sent from courts or programs. Um, what we do is we make sure that each person who is participating in any of these circles is there voluntarily and is really ready to do their own healing work. So yes, yeah, someone can be referred, but we actually work with them to make sure that that is truly a vol voluntary choice, you know. Um, so most people actually just sign up through our website or sign up because they've heard from other people. It's it's amazing how much how much of a need there is. 
So um, I think we're going to have to stop here, unfortunately, because there's so much more to say, but we'll go back in the end. Um, but I just want to say that, you know, it's that we can talk later about what happens in the circles and what, why is it restorative justice and not, for example, group therapy or um, something else. But I think that's a great introduction and thank you so much. Um, I hate to be so quick, but we're going to um, talk to Kelsey next about restorative justice in the schools. And so I'm just trying to introduce people to all of the different amazing kind of different programs that restorative justice can show up in that are not always conflict resolution, but can be. So Kelsey, um, so first of all, you're an attorney and a social worker, and you went at the same time, right, to NYU Law School and NYU Social Work School. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, do you think that prepared you for restorative justice work, or did you do that because it helped you get through law school, or what? So I think it's both probably. Um, so I, I, I initially uh, went to NYU with the intention of going to law school. So I had my first uh, internship that summer working at the door and I realized how much it would help if I had the lens of social work and a mental health background to kind of support the client population. And sort of at that point decided, hey, there's a dual degree program. It's not too late. I can still get in. And that's really how I landed there. But I really do think that my social work background, as well as my experience in law school, really helped introduce me to restorative justice and really prepared me to kind of understand um, and like, and to understand the individuals that I work with in the restorative justice field and also really systems work as well. Because I feel like my experience in law school really helped me really understand systems work. And then my experience as a social worker really helped me in connecting to participants and being present in circles. So I really think that both played a major role in sort of how I landed in this field. So what is it about restorative justice? I know you were a criminal defense lawyer, legal yes. aid first, and then you started doing other work and you were drawn to restorative justice. What is it about restorative justice that drew you to it? And then what was the mission in the schools project that you were involved in with restorative justice in the schools? Right. So I was a public defender at the Legal Aid Society for a number of years. And for me, I love being a public defender. I love defending my clients in court and providing them with legal representation. But I always felt limited in my role as an attorney. There was so much more about their life and their family systems that I really wanted to support it. And that just is not your role as a public defender. Um, you know, during my time at that office, I was really exposed to the Center for Court Innovation and they were launching this new restorative justice in schools project. So for me, I understood as a public defender that so many of my clients were pushed out of schools and sort of their first time really getting into trouble was related to an experience in the education system. So I saw leaving the Legal Aid Society and heading the Restorative Justice in Schools Project as an opportunity to kind of get to some of the clients I was working with at the Legal Aid Society before they were placed in the system. And uh, what so is restorative justice? Like what is, what does it do? So in the school context, the Restorative Justice in Schools project was meant to really, it was a research project to study the results of introducing restorative justice, particularly in schools with high suspension rates. So the schools that we were placed in were five high suspension New York City public schools, were pretty high need schools. And the, the purpose of the vision that we saw for the Restorative Justice in Schools project really was a three-tiered approach that through community building that if we could introduce circle practice and build community with students in the schools, they'd be a lot less likely to get into conflicts with each other. That in addition to community building, if we could actually offer interventions and respond to the harms happening in the school community using restorative practices, that the school community would be a safer place and that we'd be able to shift school culture and climate. And then finally, that if we could invest in these schools, in addition to introducing restorative practices that we would really support these young people in dealing with some of the conflicts that were happening in the schools and leading to suspension and leading many of our students into the criminal justice system that I was fleeing from when I went into the restorative justice in the schools project. So I'm just gonna, again, I had, a, I just saw a question in the chat that says, what is restorative justice? Because some people here really aren't familiar with it. And so I just wanna say in the criminal context, we compare, uh, our traditional legal system to the restorative justice approach at, 
in this way. In the criminal context, we'll say the questions that are asked are, what law did this person break and how long should their punishment be? Or what should their punishment be? Whereas in the restorative system, we look it's through a different lens and we're not looking at who should be punished and why. We also don't view it as a harm against the state. We, we recognize that people are harmed and that people are in relationships and relationships need to be strengthened. And we ask questions like who was harmed, understanding that it could be more than one person and how can we promote healing and who is responsible for that healing? So we look at it as a way to bring people back instead of send people away. And in the civil context, there's a similar approach. If there's harm, instead of trying to figure out who caused it so that we can assess blame, it's working on healing, working on what people need and doing it in a non-hierarchical uh, consensus kind of way as much as possible, not having lawyers, not having judges make the decisions. And so that's kind of the framework that we sort of start with. And only it's only possible to do when it's voluntary, when it's confidential, and when people, everyone has a voice. Um, so how does that happen in the schools? So I think the schools is an interesting context because kids aren't necessarily wanting to come to school every day or wanting to share in circles. So what we really did was create spaces for students to build community with each other. So for our community building circles, we ran them in homeroom or advisory, that sort of non-academic class, which that's really supportive to young people's often the first class of the day or maybe around your lunch period. And we created spaces where we conducted circles where we just talked about everyday things for young people. The opportunity to kind of sit with your classmate and sit with your teacher and talk about current events, talk about what's going on in their families, talk about their hopes and dreams for the future. So I think in addition to those spaces, we also created some really voluntary spaces. So there were student groups that were created like the Gender and Sexuality Alliance that we ran circles in. We had a men in color group that we ran circles in, created a girls group. And we just offered students who had a group of friends. I was like, hey, we'd like to get our group of friends together for a lunch period. Would you facilitate a circle with us? Or would you help us write a circle? So really creating community building spaces in schools that really didn't have many spaces like that where students were kind of free to be themselves. And can you just describe what might happen in a circle? Who would be, what does facilitating even mean? And how does it work? Sure, and I think it varied. So I think our advisory circles were often facilitated either by a member of the RJ in schools team, so a member of our staff or by a teacher. And sometimes we offered it up to students. Like next week, does someone wanna facilitate a circle? And it could be on a variety of things. So I think our most popular circles, because we're talking about high school were relationships and dating. So that those were popular topics that we often did. Um, I think like our freshman circle, we had an all, all boys freshman circle that was just really into anime and video games. So their circles were around those topics, but it was a safe space for students to kind of talk about whatever was important to them and to process things that were happening. So if we had a major event happen in the school community, we'd bring that in as a topic. Um, in addition to just creating other spaces. So I know that we had some students who were struggling with different things. So we also offer support circles. So if I have a young person who I know their parent is ill or they're dealing with some things at home, if there's a group of friends or a teacher who wants to sit in a space with that young person and really support them, we had opportunities to do that as well. Um, and so, how did these circles have any effect on teacher student relationships or did it just help the student relationships with each other and it did it did it have any effect on the suspension rate, which I know is one of your goals um, and then we're gonna that's probably going to be the last answer because we have to move on. So yes, and I think that the thing about restorative justice, as you mentioned earlier, it is voluntary. So I would say when it came to our staff in the schools, there were teachers who loved this idea and they jumped right into the idea of sharing with their students. And there were other teachers where this wasn't something that they were really interested in doing. So it really depended on sort of the teacher. We had teachers who sat in every circle that we ran and loved the opportunity to get to know their students in a different way outside of their science curriculum. And we had other teachers who felt really uncomfortable sharing about their life and their kids and their family and it wasn't something that they wanted to do so we never forced someone to be in circle we just gave it as an open opportunity for people to participate in in terms of suspension so i would definitely say we had an effect in our school and i think that our research results are going to be coming out soon and they're going to be pretty mixed and i also think that it takes time to shift culture 
and that we came into schools that knew nothing about restorative justice and we introduced this new practice and this new way of being and it grew on our students so I can tell you that our schools in our final year and unfortunately we were really affected by the pandemic so it kind of cut off our ability to really finish out the project in the way we wanted to is that there were different schools we had teachers who were upset to come to work every day who now were smiling with students in the hallway because they had opportunities to kind of build relationships outside of what they thought that they could. I also think that students just learned a different way of dealing with conflict. We offered harm circles where students who wanted to sit with the person that they got into a conflict with, they could sit in circle with them, with their friends and with the teacher who was their classroom and kind of talk about why this happened. And is there something that the teacher can do to make it less likely for the kids to get into conflict? We had a particular hallway in our school where all the fights were happening in this hallway. Like there's something else happening in the school building that if this is the place that this is always happening, we need more adults in that hallway. What's going on outside of that classroom that conflict is likely to happen there? So we're kind of able to use restorative justice to not only work with the students, but also work with the adults in the school. And the last thing that I will say is we also had a lot of success offering circle practice and professional development with teachers. You'd be surprised someone is working in a school 10 years with someone and they don't know anything about them. They don't know the name of their kids. So offering spaces for teachers to also build community with each other because the students feed off of that. When the school feels like a community from staff to students, then people are more likely to respond that way. And I'll stop there because I'm sure I'm over time. Thanks so much, Kelsey. I mean, we'll get back to all these things. Um, there's so much to ask, but thank you so much. We're just going to move on to Erica right now. And um, Erica, I think, so um, you've done a lot of different things with restorative justice. I don't want to just, you know, talk about the intimate partner violence. Um, I know that you um, ran the peacemaking program at the Red Hook Community Justice Center, and maybe that would help folks understand a little bit more about what restorative justice is and how it works. If you could kind of describe just briefly how that program worked and how cases uh, were sometimes facilitated by community members to resolve sure. themselves. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. And I just want to give a shout out to everybody. It's such a huge turnout. Lots of people I love in the in that uh, uh, in the Zoom. So thanks for coming. Um, and uh, I'm grateful to be here with my panelists as well. Um, thank you, Susan. Uh, the peacemaking program. The peacemaking program was established in 2013. So it's been running for quite some time in New York. And I think it was the right at the beginning of 2013. And um, although the, the pre-work for it um, was, was many years before, and we studied really primarily um, with Native peacemakers from the Indigenous communities from really across the United States and getting ideas about what it means to create sacred community building space um, to resolve conflicts, to, as Kelsey said, to build community. Um, and I think, as um, Sethu said, to, to really think about shame as one of these core locked up feelings that cause a lot of harm. So it's like, it's really organized around those similar um, principles, but we studied um, for the peacemaking program with um, Native American mentors who really walked us through what it would mean to set up a program like this. And just to give you some kind of idea of it, uh, just imagining you're in a conflict with someone, maybe there's been an arrest. So it could, it, in the peacemaking program, it could, it could happen through arrest or it could happen um, as a walk-in. And that program has historically taken um, conflicts from straight up from the community, from the housing, from um, directly from police, and then direct, and also directly from the court. So kind of a real um, mix of uh, types of conflicts walk through the door. And, um, we would first train a lot of community members in peacemaking being trained directly by Native American peacemakers um, and with a whole host of skills and really the skills are about listening and learning how to kind of undo that fix it brain that a lot of us have oh you have a problem I'm gonna fix it I'm gonna reply I'm gonna tell you what to do like that's a real instinct that I think many of us share or I can say just I have that instinct um, and so we try to unlearn a lot of those instincts and just learn how to listen and learn how to sit with other people and so these would be volunteers uh, almost exclusively for Red Hook there was a couple of years that we had volunteers from other parts of the city but we kind of stopped that after a while and just had volunteers from mostly who live um, or work in Red Hook and they would um, this case would come through uh, let's say it's two people who are fighting or having a neighbor dispute or a family, family violence cases. 
Um, they would both be prepared separately by staff. So the first step is, is preparation. We try to figure out what's going on in um, for these people. What are their points in which they might um, think about moving forward? And when you feel like they're ready, which is a whole process that I won't really describe right now, um, we would bring them together with members of the community who would really lead the discussion, sharing their own stories of struggle or sharing their own um, issues that they had come up for them before as a way to kind of lead people into finding consensus, as you said earlier, Susan, um, lead people to figure out, okay, how are we going to move forward? That might take three hours of sitting down and listening to everybody to unburden themselves and asking questions and sharing stories. Um, there's always food involved. Uh, or you might get to the end of the two hours or three hours and realize everything is still tense. Let's just make an agreement to take a step forward, but, but we know we're not done. And then you could come back two weeks later, um, reopen the discussion, and then hopefully within you know, two to three meetings like this, everyone has figured out, everyone's kind of done, they realize they've, they've worn out this conflict and they're kind of ready to just move forward with their life. And that's what we're trying to do, just wear them out um, in a nice and loving way. Do you have another question? Um, ready. Well, I just wanted to say, when you say they're ready to move forward with their life, that often involves very specific things that people who were harmed say they would need to move forward, right? And they would agree on, you know, well, you need to take anger management classes, or I will write a letter of apology, um, or... You know, sometimes it's really more basic than that. It, it's like... We need to, first of all, say hello to each other, acknowledge each other. A lot of times people do need to take personal steps. Like the person who might have been aggressive, for example, might have had a lot going on, might be going through grief. Very often there is grief happening. And so they might, um, they might wanna take steps towards strengthening themselves, whether it is grief counseling, like you say, or um, getting, their, their, uh, getting a job, getting a resume. So there's a lot of personal steps that people take. They kind of identify in this process for themselves, like why are they feeling so shaky? Um, and they try to take ste steps to strengthen themselves. But then a lot of times they take steps between people about strengthening the relationship. Very specific things that only people in a relationship can really say, I need you to not say this thing, or I need you to do your part uh, with respect to co-parenting. And so that can be like really um, specific. Okay, I just realized I didn't say the first code word and I'm late. So I just wanna say the first word is paper. Write it down if you want CLE credit, it's paper. Okay, so now I wanna ask you, what about intimate partner violence? It's something that's a very, very sensitive topic. There, it was, it was hotly debated in the last uh, DA election with one candidate saying, we're gonna come down really hard. We need to lock people up. And the other candidate saying, we need individual decisions in each case. Um, so how could intimate partner violence be addressed with restorative justice and when and why? I think I want to say to everybody um, in the Zoom room tonight, you know, really, if, if what I'm about to say just doesn't feel like it applies to you, it's because it, it's because it doesn't apply to you. And I think what we want with restorative justice and intimate partner violence is really a breadth of options for people and a sense that if you are harmed or you know if, or you are facing a situation that however you need to shake this out there should be someone ready and willing to listen to you to help you walk the path that you want to path at least that's my framework for this that you know i've met you know in the last couple of years especially i've met these incredible people who survived in terrible harms who are who who are looking who are looking for me, who are looking for someone to help them walk through it in the way they wanna walk through it in ways that I don't know that if I was harmed like them, I would be able to walk through it that way. Um, who want to maybe face the person who's harmed them and say, if it's intimate partner violence, you hurt me and you're not gonna do it anymore. Or if it's um, another kind of serious harm, uh, they might just wanna share their grief or share their pain, or they wanna find um, connection through and they want to find healing through hearing what the other person was going through at the time. So it's like there are just these countless types of, of ways of needing to move through harm. So for intimate partner violence, there are um, certainly across the country, both individuals and communities who just haven't felt served by the current um, legal systems, neither the civil nor the criminal system. There are also people who have felt served by those systems. 
But I think when we think about restorative justice for intimate partner violence, I'm looking for those who haven't been served, who are saying, I called the police and I feel less safe, like many do. Or I was never going to call the police to begin with. Or, and th these are true stories, I'm undocumented and I, I, how could I call the police on my undocumented ex spouse, or I'm married to somebody who works in the police, there's no way that I can call the police, right? There are just so many types of people who need ways to um, talk about the violence in their lives, get the violence to stop on their own terms. And it's just, when, it, when I think about the sensitivity of it, I, I think there's just a lot of different people out there dealing with really complex harm. And our current system, it, for what it's worth, this binary of you can get X or Y, you can get incarceration or no incarceration, you can get a protective order or no protective order. That just doesn't solve it for a lot of people who are facing these incredible complex realities that involve their children, that involve their legal documentation, that or their, their citizenship, that involve their housing, their financial security, that involve a relationship that may have all kinds of history in it, um, you know, with love, with pain, you know, and, and, and they may feel all kinds of complicated ways towards it. And I think what restorative justice offers within this context, and I'm gonna say one more thing and then I, I will stop. Um, but I think in this context, what restorative justice can offer is, um, and it's why restorative justice is really hard, is that it's, we can be complex, we can say, there is, there are people who've been harmed in this circle, people who have caused harm, those people have, have can change labels. We have, um, you know, feelings of love and feelings of hate at the same time, anger, but also hope, right? Like, and can we hold all of those feelings for people and all of those realities, not just feelings, it's also just realities that people are facing. Um, you know, sometimes I, I kind of want to go back to the legal system because I'm like, oh, it's so much easier for our, for our brains in a way. It's like there's a yes or a no, and I don't have to hold that complexity. But I think people's, the lives in their homes, we're all in our homes right now. We know it's, they, these are complex spaces and they require complex solutions. And I do think that that's what restorative justice has the possibility to offer. Now, if that's not what the person wants, they need an incapacitation, they need forced separation, and they need it now. I'm not here to ever say that that person shouldn't be seeking those outcomes. Um, but it's just, what about those who, who want something else? Um, thank you. I just want to ask one more question, and then we're going to move on to Judge Martin, which is, if someone does want to pursue restorative justice in some way, what kind of form might it take? Can you give like a concrete example of what a restorative justice outcome might mean? For domestic violence or for intimate partner violence specifically, yes. um, it can be a myriad of it can be a few things. I mean, a few examples. There could be I don't want to actually see the person who harmed me, but I need support um, in a kind of healing space, much in the way that both Sethu and and Kelsey have described. So support just for the person who's been harmed, with other people who have been harmed as well uh, have been harmed as well. And I think that what Sethu was talking about, that otherness, without the otherness of there's somebody whose responsibility it is to fix your problem. And when you remove that otherness, people can kind of have permission to, to first of all, start fixing their own problem, but also have that community of people who understand in a different way. Um, there could be uh, people who have processes um, there are programs out there that just work, work with the consent of the person who's been harmed, but they only work with the people causing harm. So let's say people who are um, hurting their intimate partners, all working together on accountability processes, but with the consent of the person who's been harmed. Um, and there are programs that bring people together and maybe it's because you share a child, maybe it's because you, you are in a particular cultural community um, and you want to, uh, you know, the norms of your community are can be both anti-violence, but, but you want to stay within your community and not call the police. And you're trying to figure out, is there some way in the middle? So those, um, those kinds of programs exist. So there could be a myriad of options. And sometimes, and I think restorative justice can do this brilliantly, is to help people break up and, but break up in a way that says, oh, I, this is the thing that I have to get off my chest. We, we all walk around with so much kind of stuck on our chest that we don't say and so many difficult conversations with the people we love that we don't have. And one of the ways that I can imagine restorative justice working really well in intimate partner violence is to be able to say the things um, that weigh on you that have been causing the story in your head and to just kind of let it go 
unburden yourself, leave it in the room, and then make these practical decisions that you need to make about how you're going to move forward, whether it is I need to co-parent with this person. I need to live next to them. We share an elder that we both care about. Um, in elder abuse, these things come up a lot and it's very similar to um, intimate partner violence. So there, there's a lot of ways in which having a meaningful and practical discussion um, that's rooted in connection can be really, um, again, practical for people to figure out how to move forward. Thank you so much, Erica. We're going to have to come back to some of these issues. Um, I just want to say for later, if we have time to have a group discussion, um, one of the questions that might be arising for people watching that occurs to me is one of the questions is, you know, the difference between how our legal system, well, there's a lot of differences between how our legal system approaches harm and how restorative justice approaches harm. But restorative justice does center the harm and the person or people who have been harmed and gives them choices about how they want to heal. Whereas the criminal justice system, it's the prosecutor's choice and to some extent the judge's choice about whether to prosecute, about what sentence, about all these things. That's not necessarily the choice of people who were harmed. And so a question we might want to talk about later is why should it be the choice of the people who are harmed versus um, the government's choice and what are the pros and cons, how it, you know, how we might want regularity in how things are treated versus make everything so individualized. So I just want to throw those questions out um, for later. And now um, I want to ask Judge Martin some questions because um, you have a very different uh, in, in many ways, but with some of the same principles. So welcome Judge Martin, thank you so much for joining us. I see um, you. So you, you were sitting as a court of claims judge and you heard a lot of civil cases and you've been a civil lawyer and you've done settlement negotiations and you've done litigation. And then you had some kind of experience that made you feel like there was something missing, right? And that, people had experienced harm that wasn't being addressed in some way. So can you just kind of give us a little background about that? Okay, yes. And let me just set the background so that people can understand what civil litigation is. We've heard a lot about different um, scenarios, but civil litigation is everything that's uh, not criminal. So it could be landlord tenant, uh, motor vehicle accidents, medical malpractice, um, breach of contract, anything where generally the parties are coming to court, they start a lawsuit and they're coming to court um, seeking money damages. Um, the litigation generally takes many years. It's quite expensive. And um, it, generally people have an attorney in order to do that. So my experience, um, I, have, I was a litigator for 30 years and then became a judge. And I, I was presented with a case in 2018 that involved a wrongful death of two uh, of a college student arising out of um, a fight at a fraternity party at a local university. Um, unfortunately, one of the students became the aggressor against another, and um, the student who was being victimized uh, stabbed and killed the aggressor student. It was a tragedy in Rochester for many reasons, obvious reasons. And the litigation that um, pursued was pursued by the family of the deceased child was um, at least seven or eight years in the making and involved an appeal and all sorts of um, legal maneuvers. And finally, it, it hits my courtroom to try the case uh, in a jury trial. And it was um, not one I was looking forward to because at that point, there were only two parties, the decedent's parents against the child that did the stabbing. And at this point, he's a young adult, but he's 25 years old and he has no money. And recall that civil court is where you go when you want money damages and, and he has nothing to offer. So what was the point of the litigation? But the families just could not move into any kind of resolution, even though I tried to settle it. Um, so we went to a jury trial. And um, right before it went to a trial, it went to the jury, the attorneys said, can we try to settle this case? And of course I was happy to let them try to do that. 
And one of the attorneys wrote up what was called a statement of humanity. It wasn't an apology, basically said, we wish things had ended up differently. We wish we could turn back the clock. Um, both parties were harmed. We want to move forward and um, forgive. And the parties agreed to it. The statement was read to the jury. Um, there wasn't a dry eye in the courtroom, including the court reporter who could hardly take down the, the transcript. Um, and then uh, the jury left and the parties came together and the families who had been on opposite sides of the courtroom um, and were very antagonistic, uh, were hugging and empathetic to the situation. And at that point, I, I realized what I knew from being a practicing attorney and a judge that often there are uh, emotional sticking points in a case. So a party can't take money, even if it's on the table and it's a, and it's a good value, or they can't ever uh, really even get to the point of discussing money because there's some emotional sticking point. And the court system is not set up to do that kind of thing. We've heard stories about the circles and all of that. There's no concept in a courtroom to sit around in a circle and talk about your feelings. But, but it became clear to me that, that it was necessary in some cases. So I was asked by the um, judge who's in charge of the court system here in Rochester to, to try and develop a program. And that's what I set about to do. Um, I put, brought together a group of attorneys uh, who practice in this area. Um, I worked with the Gandhi Institute, which is very um, powerful here in Rochester doing all sorts of wonderful restorative work. Um, I explored the literally all of the types of court systems and, and really couldn't find anything uh, like what I wanted to do. So I, I sort of developed it on my own. And um, it, it looks like a mediation. Um, and that's uh, what I've now uh, tried to institute in the cases that I handle and spread the word to other attorneys and judges about how to uh, mediate these cases using restorative justice practices. I think you're muted, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. So the second code I have to give for people who want CLE credit is ROC, R-O-C-K. You can either think of it as rock and roll or stone. Um, so write that down. And so now I'm going to continue. So first of all, I'm just wondering how your idea of somehow instituting this was um, treated by other judges and lawyers at first? Um, was it welcomed? Was it difficult? And then what did you do? How did you go about introducing it? Well, I think that um, judges and lawyers want satisfied uh, litigants, um, it, but, it, but it seemed very different to them. And um, there are a couple of techniques that I use that are very different. For example, in a typical mediation, people sit around a, a conference table, but the lawyers do all the talking. Um, and the parties um, may actually not even be in the room. And the lawyers work it out and uh, finally reach a dollar amount. In my uh, conferencing, the parties are in the room. They can bring family members with them for support um, because often it's not just the, litigate, the litigants who are injured in a particular event, but um, the family members are too. Think of a typical car accident case where someone is is injured and the spouse has to take time off from work or um, the children have to do without because uh, the mother is disabled now. And those people, they're not involved in the litigation, but they need a seat at the table. And the parties um, are able to talk about their concerns. They are encouraged to try and understand the other's position, even if they don't agree with it. And the lawyers are asked to focus on the risks of going forward with the litigation. And that's something that lawyers don't really like to do because they uh, are being hired to win a case, not focus on uh, how they might lose a case. But it's important because, because the litigants often don't uh, digest the problems. They hear on television that um, they're gonna get a million dollars. So where's my million dollars? Uh, they don't want a lawyer who's going to say, well, maybe it's a long road to getting a million dollars and here are the problems. Um, but when you force the litigants to 
realize the strengths and weaknesses of their case. It can be very powerful. How do you prepare? I mean, not to deal with not the typical kinds of things like damages and understanding they might not get a million dollars, but let's say a grieving spouse who um, needs to talk about their feelings and wants to talk about why they're so upset and not talk about things that have to do with, you know, the elements of a complaint and what has to be proven in court. Um, how are you prepared to do that? And how much preparation work do you do with each side before the meeting? Do you talk to them individually? And how does that go? I do talk to them individually. They have to buy in. It's a voluntary situation. So they have to be ready to talk about their feelings. Um, usually injured people are wanting to talk about their feelings, but also the, the person on the other side of the case, the defendant, the doctor who's been accused of malpractice, for example, um, never gets to really explain um, their side of the story. And they may want to apologize, they, or they may want to explain, this is why I did what I did. And typically in a deposition, for example, or in a courtroom, they're not allowed to really do any explanation. So the PI talk to the parties individually, make sure they understand the process. They sign a confidentiality agreement because whatever happens within this context of the conference can't be later used in court because there may be an apology, for example, and um, that can't be used if the case does not settle. Um, and I make sure that the attorneys are understanding that their role is a little bit different than it might normally be and they have to be willing to um, kind of, kind of uh, put the muzzle on. Uh, and that can be hard for attorneys um, because they are used to um, having their say. And this is all about letting the parties talk. Okay, one more question, and then we're gonna go to um, some group discussion, but um, how do you get the lawyers to be quiet when their clients want to apologize? And to support, to really let their clients explore their needs of, you know, if they feel bad about something or something that might not help the lawsuit, um, how do you get the attorneys to kind of be quiet and let their clients talk or do you? Well, it, it usually it's at the end of a lot of um, what's called discovery. So parties have done depositions, there's a lot of investigation um, and they are facing a trial. Uh, I explained to the lawyers that they're, I'm not looking for uh, someone to confess or apologize. I'm looking for someone to say, I understand what you're saying. And so the, the doctor, for example, used that um, context of a med mail case. The doctor can say, I understand it may appear that I made a mistake, but here's, here's what happened. This is why I did what I did. I'm sorry that you're in this situation because it certainly wasn't my intent that you would be injured, although it was a known risk of the surgery. So that kind of um, soft pedaling actually can go a long way for an injured person to say, oh, I see now, I, I see why that happened. Uh, there can be yelling, they, can, they don't have to be uh, friendly. Um, at the end of the day, um, the tears and the loud voices kind of calm down and um, hopefully they reach understanding. It, it, it is often successful, but it can be unsuccessful as well. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna uh, entertain some questions from people um, who are in the audience um, in a few minutes, but I just wanted to see if, um, if people wanted to talk about what happens in a restorative justice, a true restorative justice, I think Judge Martin's situation is somewhere in between a settlement conference and a restorative circle. Um, and if anyone wants to talk about some of the ways that a restorative circle is different, I mean, Sethu referred to it as a sacred space. Um, and maybe you could start to explain why or what you mean by that, just for people who really have never experienced it. And others can jump in and, and talk about how what's, what's a, an important part of a circle. You know, it was Erica that referred to it as a sacred space. I agree with her, but I mean, perhaps you can start Erica since you okay. mentioned that. Um, 
I think that, you know, I, I'm a lawyer and we're really not trained to talk about those things. Um, it's hard to talk about, but I really think that it is what is going on. It is um, about, and, and I also want to say actually before I say, it's not like, it's not, we're not just talking about our feelings or something. I think that even for me becomes dismissive in my mind when I think, oh, just talk about your feelings and get over it. Maybe just apologize. Like you can kind of imagine this way of thinking about it that would that could go down that um, that route in your mind. It's not quite that. Certainly, it's about making space for feelings in a way that we don't. So I want like on, I want to validate that. Like we certainly make space for people's feelings in a real way, but we also ask them to bring in their relationships, their ancestry, their culture their spirituality, their belief in something bigger than themselves. You know, we get stuck, I think, um, when we think about conflict within the legal binary, it's like, it's gonna be you or it's gonna be me. One of us is gonna win uh, and one of us is gonna lose. And this idea that you're, you know, there's a real Navajo concept. The Navajo nation has long led on peacemaking and there's a Navajo concept like, no, 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 no. Like this idea that, you know, you're gonna have one winner, like. We, we, we could all leave as winners or we could all leave together kind of in an equal way um, if we related to this differently, if we, if we called on me? ourselves. I'm fine, sleepy. Oh. I have 10 more minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, I think like we, we do really want to, I thought that was me for a second. Um, we do really want to call on people's bigger selves, bigger belief systems, and that does create something sacred in the room. It, it can sound, um, it, that might sound weird or, um, but that is kind of what happens. And by kind of, I mean, it's definitely what happens when it's done um, with intention and in the right circumstances. And sometimes we get pieces of that or moments of that, you know, there's never this full, uh, you know, perfect process, but certainly um, that's what we're trying to call into the room. Because otherwise, how do you get over, not get over, but how do you even face and express such difficult moments in your life um, in, with your community, with your supporters? You can't do that unless you're, you're asking people to really show up in their best framework um, in a sacred way. That's what I'll say. Say through, I'm passing it to you. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about what, when you when we say sacred, we're, I was thinking at the heart of it is really connection. You know, when we connect with one another or we connect with something greater than ourselves, whether it's nature or some some higher power that we we may believe in. And so ultimately, I think it really is about connection. And so when you every single person here, I'm sure, has had that experience when you when you're moved in a way because you're connecting with by walking in the park or when you're engaging with another human in a deeply powerful way, or when you're in prayer. Um, I think that that connection is quite sacred. And I think that's a lot of the restorative processes. Again, when done with intention and care and time, you know, it's very easy to sit here and talk about all of these different people, the person who was harmed, caused harm sitting together, but there's a lot of work that goes into supporting each of those people to show up at their very best in order to, lean into that and make that connection possible. And I think that's what sacred really means to me in these spaces. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, I'm wondering for you how you create that feeling in schools with students for community building. And then I wanted to move on to how you also could use circles in schools to address conflict in the schools. But first, how do you create your circles in the schools with young people to be either a sacred space or some space where people kind of rise to the occasion to be kind of their, their best selves and be really present. I think for us, it, it's really around relationships. And I think at the core of it is relationships. And I know we'd had teachers who say, oh, I'm struggling with circles in my class. And I'm like, well, what is your relationship with the young people when you're not in circle? So I think the success of that is like, are you a warm and friendly face when kids walk into your math class like if you don't have a relationship with a young person, I think particularly with young people who I think often have a lot of guards up and they're not ready to open up, that those fundamental relationships in the school is what really creates safety in a circle space. So students knew that they could drop by the restorative justice coordinator's office at any point. So when I'm sitting with you in circle, it's not because I just showed up for circles because I'm showing up for you every day in the school community so that when we are getting together in circle, it feels sacred because these are real 
relationships that aren't necessarily about we're sitting in circle, but because we have those connections and relationships with you. And in terms of using circle practice in a school in a harm context, it goes back to that as well, is that you need people who have those relationships with the young people that they feel safe to be vulnerable because there's a lot of vulnerability that happens in circle and being honest about how you're feeling what, and what happened for you and really creating that safe space. And I think for young people, particularly when you're talking about doing conflict circles, a lot of that was our preparatory work. A lot of that was sitting with a student for an hour and saying, well, what do you want to say to this person? And like, okay, I heard that. Now, if you heard that, what would you feel? And they're like, hmm, maybe I want to say it a little differently. Like, may, I understand. So I think spending that time to process with people, to prepare them for circles is also a really important part. And it's not that you're coaching them from what they want to say, but just having an opportunity to really process this space that we're going to step into and preparing them to be like open and honest and willing to hear what that other party is going to say. And I know that there was a question in the chat around getting to truth. Um, and I think that's an interesting question because I don't, I don't think that restorative justice is designed to find truth. And I think people's truths can be different. And I think that in some native practices, you don't even talk about the past. Like if you're going into circle, it's just completely forward looking. And I found that we had a lot of success preparing our students to be in conflict circles. And we're saying, there's a good possibility that they're gonna have a very different experience from you. And that what, what happened for you may be very different from them. And are you open to hearing what that person's experience was and figuring out how we could move forward in a good way and not be in conflict with each other going forward. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to say thank you for all of this because I agree and I think it's really important to say the last thing you said that restorative justice is never, I don't think anyone's offering it as a complete replacement of our legal system or our criminal justice system. And as Erica was saying, it's this breadth of tools that people need different things. There are some people who have been subjected to violence or harm who would never want to be sitting in a courtroom and talking to strangers about it as a witness. And that would feel like another assault. And for those people, maybe sitting in a circle where everybody's, it's focused on healing the harm instead of just, you know, exposing it. And the approach is not heading towards incarceration is much more comfortable for other people you know, they're comfortable in the courtroom. So it's not that it's being offered as a absolute replacement for all cases. And if you're going to do restorative, if, if for example, someone who's harmed in a crime wants to talk to the person who caused the harm, that would only work if both people wanted to do it. That has to be voluntary. So um, there may be an alternative if the person who caused the harm doesn't want to, and maybe it would also work for them to meet with someone else who has had that experience and to talk to them and find out why they did it and get to express to them how they were harmed. But that's again, um, everyone's voluntary um, approach and everyone's need. So it's never, and, and I agree that restorative justice is not set up, it's not supposed to be a fact finding tool. It's about healing and it's about accountability. And it's for people who are willing to accept that people may have different versions of what happened but we're gonna focus on what we need now. How can we move forward as a community? And the focus from the indigenous perspective is that when we're a community and we all have a role to play and we all interact with each other and we live in relationships, how can we bring each other back? How can we work together and live together moving forward? And that's kind of the goal. And I think it does apply to the world we live in now because we've become so compartmentalized, especially as lawyers, for those of us who are lawyers and who have been told that our emotions can't be part of it, um, that to be able to see each other as human beings and look each other in the face is um, actually a new experience for people who have practiced in the courtroom. And so restorative justice brings those understandings, understanding that the person who caused harm may have been harmed um, and that the person who's been harmed may have caused harm and maybe not. But the, for people who want to engage in that kind of conversation, if it would be healing, it should be available. Um, so I think um, I'm looking at um, questions here on the chat um, and uh, there's a question, how is the power differential between teachers, administrators, and students? How does that, because we talked about restorative justice circles, 
being non-hierarchical. And that's also a question for Judge Martin um, that as a judge, um, you know, Setu talked about being a facilitator at Hidden Water, where the facilitator is an equal member of that circle and has had the experience of all of the other people to take away that feeling that I'm the social worker and I'm going to tell you what to do. So, you know, the question for Judge Martin is, what do you think about what if somebody else who was a facilitator who didn't carry authority um, was the facilitator? And then for Kelsey, that power differential in the class, in the schools, like when the teacher is a facilitator versus when a student is. So um, Judge Martin, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Well, it, it is um, a dangerous thing. And I really try to be totally aware of, of who I am when I'm in one of these um, conferences and trying not to insert my authority. I try to be part of the the group discussion. Um, you know, we go by first names. Um, I'm not the judge in the case. It's not my case. I'm there to try and bring the understanding and the parties together. So um, I, I just have to be fully aware of that. Now there are attorneys who do mediation and um, they can use these techniques. So it isn't, it doesn't have to be a judge who's doing this. Um, and, and hopefully it won't be because um, all, I think all mediators should use restorative justice techniques. It, it, it works and it's, um, it's a way for a case to be fully resolved. Thanks. Um, Kelsey, um, how about that power differential? Well, I think that was the hardest part for our teachers. And I think it's, it's the part that the kids enjoyed the most is that we're sitting in circles, like you can speak when you have the talking piece. So Ms. Johnson- Could you explain, could you explain what that means? What's the talking so piece? In, in, in circle practice, you can use talking pieces. Some people use them, some people don't. Um, a talking piece basically is some object usually that um, we have signified as essentially the mic. And when you have it in your hand, you get to speak uninterrupted until you've said everything that you've needed to say. And I think for young people, particularly in a school setting where there is no other place in the school where that is the case, it was very powerful. And I think for teachers, they want to, and we're like, well, you don't have the talking piece. That young person's still speaking. There's things that they need to say. And that's a really powerful and, and sort of controlling the ability to stomp out voices. And I think for our students, particularly in underserved schools and in communities that really don't often have voice, it was very powerful to be able to say everything that they needed to say uninterrupted without someone taking the mic away from them. So I think that that was very helpful. And I think it was really helpful, especially in our harm circles, when we're now asking, well, how did this harm happen? Like, what do you think contributed? For a teacher to hear a student say, honestly, I think this fight happens because she doesn't control her classroom. And like, I don't feel safe in her classroom. And you got to sit and listen to that as an adult in a way that there isn't other places in the school where a young person can be honest about how they feel when they're in her class and what kind of instruction that they feel that they're getting. Um, so really the talking piece played a huge role in really allowing young people to have voice and um, eliminating the power dynamic that I think is standard to classrooms. Thank you. Um, I just want to say the third, the code, the third word in the code is scissors. Um, so my code is another way of resolving conflicts, which is the old rock, paper, scissors version. And Setu, you had um, something you wanted to add to that about um, power dynamics, maybe? I'm not sure. Or you wanted to give an example of something that we were talking about before? Yeah, but we, it, we can, can, if there's a new question, I was speaking, I was actually thinking of an example of a case I'm working on. I won't really share many details, but it's in the, it's a, it's some, it's by a, the person who reached out to me was a young woman who was sexually harmed by her intimate partner while they were in relationship and who wanted to have a process, who wants to have a process with them. Um, and the, the, the thing that I'll share, and I'm in conversation with both people and potentially other people who are in community with them. Um, but the thing that I wanted to share most about what she said is that she said in previous relationships she's been harmed in similar ways but during that time she it was very easy it was very simple for her it's like they sucked they were terrible people but then she said right now in this context like i'm not able to say they suck they're a horrible human even though this has happened and they harmed me in this way and so i need to have a conversation with him for that reason and that's the that's the 
the scenario in a way that's how it came to me and you know I'm in conversation with her and the and the ex-partner and we're talking about who else could be part of that community that they belong to that could be there be there in support um, so that, that I was thinking that when we were talking earlier maybe out of place at the moment no I mean I think it gives people an understanding of what kinds of cases can be processed in a circle via restorative justice and when people would prefer restorative justice and not to go to court, because I think people sometimes imagine, why would you ever want to sit with that person? And um, I think it's a, it's, it's a helpful example to understand. Um, I, there's a question here that I'm reading. I'd be curious to hear about what you think are strategies that organizers or community members can use to create larger buy-in to using restorative practices at the community level um, to somehow expose, I'm not sure what the question is getting at, but to help people understand what restorative justice is and how it might be useful to them. Um, a lot of people hear it and they think it's just, that's being soft on crime. Why would I want to let someone off the hook? Um, and I think maybe the question is about how would you explain to people in the community how it might um, actually be helpful to them or appealing to them? If anybody wants to try that. Hi, um, my name is Gladys Brooks from SOS Save Our Streets Bronx. And um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk from uh, the youth standpoint, um, working in the detention centers, uh, NSD, um, non-secure facilities, I've learned that the youth, they just want instant gratification. And also the oohs and the ahs is what messed them up. And the oohs and the ahs are people surrounding them that's telling them what they need to do, what they should do um, in terms of whatever the, whatever's going on with, what, with another youth. So what we have to do is we have to teach the facilitators, the staff in these facilities, because sometimes the staff is what makes the kids get out of hand. You have staff that's very unprofessional. And if they have an issue with a kid, the kid, what they do is talk about it to in front of other kids. And sometimes let's just say you have Sally and Mary and they're, get, they're getting into it. But Sally, um, one of the staff, Jessica is a staff member and Sally loves Jessica, but now Mary disrespected Jessica. Sally wasn't there, but now Mary's talking about it in front of everybody. And guess what? I'm, I'm sorry, Jessica is talking about it in front of everybody. And then Mary goes and approach and then it becomes a fight and it becomes like hostility. So I think first we have to train the staff. And like somebody said, um, about the teachers, some it's one thing when you're talking to staff as a child and letting them know how you feel and what they feel that you should do better in your position. But then there's another thing when you have that staff holding that against them. So now it turns into friction and it causes more problems. I've, I've had kids that uh, when we had circle ups and just to get down to the main issue, Sometimes you have to get everybody else out the room, anybody right. that's surrounding it so that they can be able to talk with each other and have a real conversation without worrying about if someone is feeling like they're punking out and they're, you know, they're accepting the fact that it can be peace. Thank you, Gladys. I, unfortunately, we're out of time. We're just about out of time right now, but I just want to say thank you. I think that's a real example and restorative justice doesn't have to be a circle and it could be individual meetings when things are too stressful to be in a room with other people. And that was an example of real conflict that would take a lot of preparation and work before you could get to the point of a restorative circle if that's what people wanted. But thanks so much for that. Um, and thank you so much to everybody for coming. Um, this was just a taste of so many things. I wanna thank our wonderful panelists again for participating and people are, have a lot of reading material they can follow up with. And so um, hopefully your questions will get answered and good night, everybody. Stay in touch and learn more about restorative justice. We're all here and um, 
you know, there are the Center for Court Innovation is findable online. Restorative Justice Initiative is a clearinghouse for everything in New York, uh, restorative justice. So those are places that um, you can find online. Take care and thank you. Thank <laughs> you.